Hey guys, how's it going? Hey, the from HR Utilities. Indeed, hello, it is me, Ramit. Yeah, and we're back for part three, I believe, of our How Computer Works series. Indeed. Now, last week we talked about the BIOS, yeah. which is quite important for booting up the computer, but now we're going to talk about something which is arguably more important, yeah. the CPU. CPU. Now, for a person, their CPU would probably be their brain. So the point of the CPU is to do all the calculations for the computer. So this can be either the background calculation, or it can do the calculations for the pixels on the screen. Yeah. So, to begin with, a CPU, well, it talks to the RAM, hmm. well, through the chipset, the North Bridge. Hmm. And it takes information from the RAM and puts it in this thing called the cache. Now, the cache is a small, well, storage area for things for the CPU to do. So, different CPUs have different caches, and different generations of CPU have different caches. So, for example, a third generation Intel i5 at, with a quad core 2.3 gigahertz and an Intel fourth gen core i5, which is quad core with 3.3, so the same power. The difference will most likely be that the fourth generation has more cache than the third generation. Yeah. Um, so I think with processors, there's there's a lot of things that you need to know about behind it. So um, I think shall I explain the concept of 32-bit and 64? I understand the concept between them, but if you wish to, you okay. can, and I'm going to. Yeah. Okay. So processors come in two types. It's well, three types, but we'll leave it out. Um, it's 32-bit and 64-bit. Now, what essentially these are is the amount of calculations you can run. Okay, so if you think of it like this, 32-bit uh, versus 64. 64-bit is much, much better because there's more things you can use. You, yep. you can utilize, for example. Yep. So that's RAM. So uh, if you think about it like this, 32 bits is saying you have 32 librarians and you want 64 books, okay? Yeah. So it will take the librarians two sets of trips to get those 64 books. Whereas if you had uh, 64 librarians and 64 books, it will take them one set of trips. So if you think about this in the long, uh, long term, Having a 64-bit processor is going to improve your performance greatly because it's being able to calculate more things um, per, per trip. Yep, and obviously 32-bit RAM hmm. has a limitation of 4 gigs. 4 gigs, yeah. Well, 32-bit CPUs have a limitation of 4 gigs of RAM, yeah. whereas 64-bit have, I think it's 16 billion gigabytes of RAM as their limit. Yeah. Which will never be used. This, uh, pretty much, 64-bit, you can put over 128 gigs of RAM. And I don't know how many people have 128 gigs of RAM installed. Um, <laughs> not many, by the sounds of it. Yeah. The only people that would, would probably own a server to do so. Yeah. Because that's really the only reason you, you could have for 128 gigs of RAM. Yeah. Unless, of course, you're Bill Gates, in which case you're just an idiot. Yeah, pretty much. So, <laughs> I think the best thing about 64-bit processors is something called... Okay, right, this is me being an Intel fanboy, but it's something called hyperthreading. Ah, okay? uh, yes, right. our good friend. Hyperthreading basically means that you can double the amount of cores. Yeah. It sounds um, it's kind of, yeah, it, it sounds, yeah. you know, fake, a rumour. Yeah, like, yeah. possible you can turn a quad core into a octa -core. octa core, which is ridiculous, by the way. But it can work, right? So what hyperthreading does is it takes the cores and virtualizes those cores, of right? And in essence, what happens is the amount of cores doubles. So say you have a, a dual core processor, with Intel hyperthreading uh, enabled, you could get the performance of four cores 
on a two core processor. So on the pro the physical processor, there are only two cores. Can there only, yeah. will only ever be two cores? No. Unless of cool. course you upgrade yeah. it. Right. But virtualizing those cores, you can double it. Yeah. Making it faster, making processing uh, a breeze, I guess. Yeah. It means that it's useful. But I would say it's more useful on quad core processors yeah. because you just get a huge yeah, you increment. Yeah, eight cores. Yeah, which is even from quad core to optical, that's a ridiculous increase. Yeah, I mean, even people have eight cores, you can get sixteen cores. Okay, it's ridiculous. There's no end. Yeah, if you do have a 60, 16 core computer. You may want to think about, I don't know, selling it to us. <laughs> don't give it to him. Yeah, I'll only use it to but hack. But yeah, the problem so, the, yeah. Well, so yeah, multi-threading, well, multi-threading, hyper-threading, hyper sorry, is very useful. Yeah. And it's even more useful the more cores you have. Yeah. Now, system cache, which I talked a little bit about earlier, is also extremely important because it's how much your CPU can handle at once. Mm -hmm. It just makes the time it, it just makes the time a CPU has to process a little bit shorter. It's sorry about that disrupt that there anyway. Okay, so the time it takes well, the cache is very we're going to move on to the cache, a good friend of the CPU. Now this is effectively like a small storage device attached to the CPU. This allows the CPU to process things faster and more efficiently because it takes the it takes whatever is needed from the RAM and it places it in itself. Now what it then does is it gives this to the CPU when it asks for it and it well the CPU goes through it in a timely fashion. So it asks for the first one and processes the first command, moves on, processes the second, moves on, processes the third. This takes very little time for the CPU because, as we all know, the clock speed of a CPU is nowadays normally more than about 2 gigahertz. Minimum. Minimum. There are computers which, yes, you can get 4 gigahertz processors, 3 gigahertz, 3.9 gigahertz. Now, the clock speed of a CPU is how many calculations it can do in one second or how many hertz. So, gigahertz is 1 gigahertz equals a billion calculations a second. Hmm. That silence there was to just let that sink in. A billion. That is more than you could probably do in a few days. Because it just, it has to do a lot, the CPU. Yeah. And we're creating more and more softwares that need lots of CPU power. So the more powerful the CPU becomes, the more powerful things we the more powerful the things we can run on our computers are. So, for example, I have a terrible laptop, 2.3 gigahertz dual core. Now, we talked about cores earlier with yeah. hyperthreading. Uh, the cores on a CPU are how many technically C separate CPUs it has on it. So, a single core CPU obviously only has one processor. A dual core has two processors, meaning it, get, it can do two calculations at a time, double, which doubles the speed. Quad core obviously quadruples the speed because it can do four calculations a second, and I believe now the new Macs have hex core processors, yeah. which is going to be enjoyable. I mean, the new Mac Pro comes based with twelve cores, twelve cores, right? With hyperthreading, <laughs> that's twenty-four cores. Right. When do we want to? I don't know. I when do we want to stop? Probably when we reach Moore's law. Yeah. I think, just quickly explain what uh, the disadvantages of having a 32-bit processor is. You can't run the basic Windows apps. Yeah, you just to, can't. To, to a full extent. Because everything's made for 64-bit nowadays, but say you have a 32-bit processor, sorry, a 32-bit program on a 64-bit processor, you can see how how much of a difference 64-bit makes because you can see that the time it takes to do certain things just is, yeah halves effectively hmm. and the thing is as we said 4 gigs of RAM that's the limitation with 32-bit 
Now, you may think four gigs is quite a lot. Yeah. No. Oh, no, it isn't. Not by today's standards, no. Yeah. To we, one, have, we have programs that use a minimum of eight gigs now. Yeah. Minimum. And that's And these aren't even softwares that are professional. These are just normal softwares. Yeah, like people can go out and get. Yeah, and also the RAM limitation has its disadvantages for video editors. Yeah. Because the, le the less la RAM you have, mm. the longer it takes to process mm. the video. But RAM is another, another topic. Mm. I think what we should quickly do before we end this is talk about Intel versus AMD. Oh, yeah. Right. The, the people you are listening battle. to, yeah, the people you are listening to currently are both Intel fans. Yeah. But we, we love Intel. Yeah, Intel's good. They, they know what they're doing with CPUs. Yeah. Now, the main difference between AMD versus Intel is I AMD know. is more clock speed and single core processing. Mm. However, Intel is more... Um, Multi-core cores and uh, hyper-threading, yeah, hyper-threading and uh, multi-core scores. So if you took, if you did a Geekbench on, you know, a Intel PC, yeah, you'd get a higher multi-core score. Yeah, but but on each AMD, core, yeah. each single core does less. Yeah, which depends on what you're using the program for. Now in my uh, CPU Affinity program, yeah, if you were going to use CPU Affinity. It's inadvisable to do that on a on a on, a, on an Intel CPU. Yeah. Because each core is less powerful, it's more advisable to do that on AMD. Mm -hmm. Therefore, AMD is good if you're planning to just use one or two programs which are very CPU intensive. Yeah. Intel is better if you're going to use a computer for general I use. I think AMD is more suited towards 32-bit. Yeah. Intel is more suited towards 64-bit because yeah. I know this is going to spark a lot of debate, but AMD has always been for, it's always been cheaper. It's yeah. Been like, a, a, like, Intel's always been... A, the more expensive yeah, option. A greater quality, you know, you could expect it to get great performance, you can overclock it. Yeah. Overclocking is something we do need to talk about. Yes, actually, overclocking is effectively... Uh, all CPUs have a little b a boundary for how many calculations they can do a second. This is to make sure that A, the CPU doesn't overheat, yeah. and B, to make sure that it doesn't melt the hard drive. Because yeah. that's quite common in laptops. Yeah. Just, just saying. Anyway, so yeah. Overclocking is when you up the CPU power, and you also up the heat output. Therefore, if you're going to overclock, I advise that you use... A water cooling system, or you have multi more fans. Yeah. Way more fans. I'm talking about eight minimum. I think the the good thing about overclocking is you can get more processes done. Um, yeah. I think it's also really good if, for example, you're using a server, hmm. because the server is all about redundancy. If you overclock, yeah. because the CPU is unlikely to break. If you just overclock, you can just continue using it as normal, and it just means you get a little bit more bang for your buck, and it means that you're unlikely to need a new CPU yeah, very anytime true. soon. Yeah, I think I was playing around with the Raspberry Pi, oh um, God, yeah. and it had five overclock settings from like, I can't remember the exact, but I know it was somewhere like one gigahertz, no. all the way to ten gigahertz. <laughs> Obviously I went for like, I, I ran ten gigahertz for one boot. That was crazy fast. Yeah, but the and thing... And it's on the Raspberry Pi. Yeah, well, so. yeah, yeah, yeah. But the thing is, what type of cooling would you have needed to keep that up? Honestly. But you see, it's an ARM chip. Yeah. So, it's a very small chip, used in mobile phones. Yeah, so. but even though, that would still create a lot of heat. No. Because... No. Oh, good. It's I might flash, isn't it? It's flash storage. Oh, okay, I might actually consider putting that in my server then. Yeah. But I think, I think that's yeah, where we need but to But 10 live. gigahertz is pretty much what an Intel i5 quad-core can give out. No. Oh, no, without hyper-threading, obviously. Yeah. With hyper-threading, it's about half. So I think we'll leave it there for today. Indeed. Um, thanks for watching, guys. If you have any other questions or would like to see an extended clip of Rami explaining Moore's Law, uh, drop a like or 
tell us in the comments. But yeah. other than that, uh, I hope you enjoy the video. As always, like us on Facebook. Plus, to end, I'll catch you later. Goodbye. Peace.